and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. That guy over there, Tim Dennis. Hello, Tim. Howdy. Well, listen, we've had a lot of conversations recently regarding UFOs. Mm -hmm. Disclosure, strange things in the sky, celebrity sightings, you name it. And we've, we've pontificated about what does this all mean? Where are we going? Well, we're revisiting today with a friend who has been on the show in the past. And um, he had written a book back in 2016. It has been updated. Uh, There's a lot of great new information in it and uh, re-released. So we're welcoming back to the show, Ryan Sprague. Ryan, welcome back. Thank you for coming in. My pleasure, guys. Hey, it's been it's been a while since we last spoke and a lot has happened. So I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. Somewhere in the skies, a human approach to the UFO phenomenon. We have a link to that book, the updated version, in today's program guide. So you can make sure to find that and keep up with what uh, what's going on. It, you know, Ryan, let me just start with that. With all the strange stories and people coming forward telling these stories, you know, it, it makes me wonder. I, I've heard from a few sources myself that say that disclosure is coming in a very roundabout way and that some of these celebrities that are considered influencers are actually telling stories. Bec- they're, they're being educated and they're being um, kind of cajoled into doing this mm. because they are influencers in the media. They're influencers to large swaths of public opinion. And, and this is happening. Do you give any credit to that when you hear stories of, I don't know, you know, uh, Tom DeLonge or, or even people like Miley Cyrus and Khloe Kardashian and Demi Lovato and, and other celebrities you wouldn't expect to hear this stuff from coming forward with stories of UFOs and alien contact? That's a really good question. I mean, we always hear the this idea that there's some sort of insidious plan to uh, drip, drip disclosure, as it were. And uh, hey, I mean, there's probably truth behind some of it. But um, yeah, you know, Tom DeLonge, probably the most vocal and out in front of us right now person advocate for the UFO topic. Uh, he he knew full well what he was signing up for when he started doing everything he's doing right now and uh, getting the UFO subject uh, more attention than it's ever gotten before and um yeah i was just reading today about demi lovato and miley cyrus like you said and you know what i think more than this being some sort of concerted effort or big strategic plan i think the topic of ufos is just now more mainstream and more actually cool to talk about than it ever has been before. And I'm riding that wave, man. Like, this has been amazing for us UFO researchers out there these past few years with all the New York Times articles and and everything like that. So I think it's more people, especially celebrities, you know, we can't get them to shut up most of the time. Uh, they they think it's cool and they're they feel empowered to come forward and talk about weird things they've seen and that does trickle down to everyday people you know uh every civilian out there who's had a ufo event and was afraid to talk about it they're now doing it so you know what i'm all for it any celebrity who wants to come forward with a story it only makes it easier for the the rest of the people out there who are heavily influenced by these people so yeah i think it's exciting no matter what All right, so let's talk about uh, discrediting. We release a certain amount of information that is very interesting, coming from the government, but still elusive, right? They'll say, we've got this footage, but they won't necessarily admit it's otherworldly or from another planet, another uh, dimension, whatever you want to refer to it as. But they'll, they'll expose this, put it out there, and then... You have celebrities coming forward that, you know, unfortunately, Miley Cyrus has to back up her story with, well, I did see this while my friend and I were dealing with weed wax, right? (laughs) And so then is it, is it give two inches, take one back? You know, do you believe that, that people coming forward like that are doing more damage to the credibility or the conceivability of the reality that something is brewing, something is happening? Mm -hmm. I I do think it is a case to case basis. And, uh, you know, yeah, that is unfortunate when you hear, oh, yeah, I was on mushrooms or like I I was a six pack in of Coors Light or something like that. But um, I think, you know, 
I think no matter what attention the topic gets is good. And um, maybe there's a an effort to discredit or, uh, you know, to th- that ridicule factor, Dave, I think will always be there, I guess is what I'm trying to say. No matter how serious we take it, uh, it takes the mainstream a while to catch up to the rest of us who have been taking this seriously forever. But I do see the tides changing. And, uh, you know, whether it's Fox News, CNN, uh, give or take whatever mainstream network you might tune into, uh, it's changed. The entire conversation has changed and they are taking it a lot more serious. And whether it's like we said, Tom DeLonge or a new documentary by James Fox, these are the things that are putting it out there and showing the public people are taking this seriously. Your government is finally taking this seriously, which they haven't done, you know, for a really long time. So again, yeah, I think it is a case to case basis and whoever, if there is a, um, discrediting happening i think it's at the hand of the uh the celebrity or witness themselves for sure well there you know it, it, it was the the um plausible deniability of the government according to some of the experts uh, out there that say that the whole idea of discrediting these things was was always part of mm-hmm. um the plan Let's leak the information out, give it certain bits, but then take it away by then discrediting the people that have had these experiences. And, and that, you know, I mean, you, you can kind of see some of that, but I, then I wonder, is it all in the hands of just our nefarious shadow government that's doing that? Or do you believe that there's some element of, of the aliens protecting themselves by doing that as well? They'll, they seem to give information right to, Ooh. um, certain elements, uh, in the, in the, in the field, you know, certain, uh, people that they contact, which make them seem very credible. And then they'll say, but we're going to make ourselves known on July 4th over Las Vegas and the world turns its eyes to the skies. And as usual, nothing happens. Um, you know, so it makes you wonder then, are they dealing with the, you know, dick aliens or you know, <laughs> what, 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 what exactly is really going on with this? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I mean, they might be, Highly intelligent and advanced and enlightened, but they might still have a sense of humor too, David. I think that's that's something to keep in mind. Maybe they do like pranking or punking us every now and again. But you know right, what? But, I, if but if your story is, I want the world to come together. You people have to work together. You've right. got to save your planet. You've got to save each other. You've got to start working like this. Their punking only discredits the rest of the story that the the narrative that they're trying to put out there. Mm-hmm. That is, you know what I mean. Point. Absolutely. So, so if you're so enlightened and intelligent, it seems counterproductive, counterintuitive to play these games. And I understand everybody's got a sense of humor, right? We we found that out about aliens with Mork. But uh, yes, I'm aware, <laughs> folks, before you write me an email, he was not a real character. But uh, still, I just uh, there, there are just elements to this I can't understand and I can't get past with what is really going on. And I know in your book, you you tackle it, as you said, from a very human perspective element, you know, mm-hmm. uh, to, to the approach of, of UFO phenomena. And you've got quite a few new stories and updates that you've added to this book. So let's, for people that maybe didn't hear your first, um, interview or, uh, you know, haven't picked up the book in its first iteration, give us kind of an encapsulation description of what it was that you brought to the world with your first book. Yeah. So, I mean, I wanted to contribute something new to the entire conversation, Dave. And for me, you know, all these UFO books out there I'd grown up with and I'd I'd read on a, God, a daily basis. uh, They all were littered with times and dates, you know, uh, size of the craft, how far up it was. And yeah, I mean, that data is extremely important when we're trying to compile these things. But for me, that human element is something that always kind of spoke to me. I I was trained as a playwright. I went to school for theater. I Characters, building characters is my life. So I thought, you know, if I have this side interest in UFOs uh, and a skill set of creating characters, how can I infuse that sort of analytical part of my brain to the UFO topic? And I thought, what better way than to focus on the people having the experience rather than just what they saw? Uh, so I really focus in the first and second edition of the book on um, on how this affected people. You know, in a play, we're dropped in the lives of some people at the most pivotal moment of their life that that changes them. So for a lot of these witnesses and, you know, experiencers in the UFO world, 
that was a very pivotal moment in their lives. And it did change them in, in many drastic ways. So I focused on that. How did it change these people? What did they believe it was rather than an author or investigator telling them what it was? And uh, ultimately, how did it change them fundament fundamentally? So, yeah, it, it was really putting a microscope on the, the witnesses and the people and kind of maybe that could give us answers to what we're dealing with. And it really struck me the patterns I found and, and the disconnects I found. I mean, none of this is, you know, easy. None of this has a straight answer to what UFOs are or represent. And that was exciting and frustrating and everything in between. So, yeah, the first book covered about, I'd say, 40 people collectively around the world. And with this updated version, almost four years later, post New York Times articles and Tom DeLonge and, and a whole new world, I guess, of UFO disclosures. Uh, how did that change the people? Did had did their events continue? And what new stories could I bring to the table? So it is ultimately more of a uh, sociological study uh, or a case study than uh, a straight up UFO book, I guess. Do you run the risk of humanizing these people? And then when we, you know, it's one thing when you see them in these um, shown in a light where, you know, uh, where these documentaries are showing them to try to show the legitimacy of their claims or show the illegitimacy of their claims. Each documentary seems to take its own tact. Do you run the risk as somebody who wants to share this of, of humanizing people, showing their flaws that it might end up rocking the credibility of the overall, you know, the, the arching story? That's a really good point. I mean, when I first set out to do the original version of the book, I told these people flat out, I'm using your real name. Like, I don't want pseudonyms. I don't want anonymous. Like, if you're going to come forward with a story, embrace it. And if, if you're not willing to do that, I'm sorry. This just isn't the, the platform for you to get your story out. And I mean, everyone, everyone I spoke to was willing to do that. And that was a trust, I think, I built with these individuals and a trust they had in me to tell their story in, you know, the, the best of light I could. And I told them, again, this is brutally honest. I want to know intimate things about your life. Like if, if you're married, like how did this affect your relationship? Like you say you're abducted by aliens 20 times. What does your wife think of that? What do your kids think of that? Uh, you know, or I talked to a former minister of a church and he said he was abducted by aliens. So what does your congreg congregation think about that, man? Like it's got to come up at some point. So it was a very deep dive into these people's lives. Very intimate, very, uh, uh, powerful. And uh, I mean, it was amazing. And I, I, I learned so much throughout the process, not just about these people's encounters, but them as human beings. And I feel like I've made a lot of new friends, maybe some enemies, I don't know. But uh, at the end of the day, it was more about these people and um, putting their story out there in the most credible way I could, Dave. I mean, I wasn't out to answer what happened to them, just merely give them a voice with the platform, you know, or opportunity I've been given to, to do that. And, uh, it, it's been amazing. I, I've, I've become very close with some of these witnesses and they've shared continuations of their experiences with me. And, uh, I, I hold that very, very deep. I mean, that trust has, you know, it can't be broken. So, yeah, it's been a very rewarding experience for me as a writer, and I hope for them as individuals coming forward with these things. When you go back to revisit these stories, revisit these people, was there ever a time where you go back? Sometimes we talk to experiencers, their story changes, maybe even in subtle ways, but it makes the story more believable or sometimes less plausible. Did that ever occur for you in this reexamination of the cases and stories that you covered in the first edition of this book? Yes. And I mean, not in a, a uh, I would say, elaborating or uh, what's the word, exaggerating. You know, like you said, a lot of the time in the UFO field, we hear a story and then as time goes on, yeah. These little things get built upon it, and uh, it, it becomes almost unrecognizable from the original story. And that, that is an issue. And, you know, I know. I know I've been lied to in the past. I know I've been BSed. Uh, but as time has gone on, I mean, I've been interviewing people now for 
over almost two decades now. I, my first UFO interview was when I was 13 years old. I interviewed a Vietnam veteran about a UFO sighting. So, I mean, as the years have gone on, I feel like my BS detector has gotten much better. And uh, when it comes to the people in the book, yes, stories do evolve. Uh, they change. And I attribute that more to their idea and concept of the event has evolved. Their their thoughts on it have evolved. I mean, a prime example of that outside of the book would be someone like Travis Walton from the famous Fire in the Sky incident. I mean, this guy had an incredible event. His story never changed throughout the decades. Uh, but he has come to a, I guess, a kind of profound idea that when he was hit with a beam that night in the woods in uh, Arizona, that uh, they took him up in the ship to repair him, to fix him. And that took him decades to try to unravel and figure out. So there are similar things with the people I interviewed in 2016 for the book and uh, in 2020. Now, their stories don't change, but they do uh, evolve and they have different thoughts and theories and opinions. And I think that's great. I think, you know, being able to to change your mind is one of the most important things when it comes to all this, Dave, because, you know, as I do, like none of us truly, truly know what's going on with any of these phenomena, whether it's paranormal or UFOs or cryptids. Uh, and we have to be willing to change our minds and and uh, take into consideration other things. So, yes, yeah, people's stories do change. And um, it's up to the individual interviewer or researcher to decide is this just an evolution of their thought or are they straight up changing the story? And uh, sometimes that can be messy and awkward. And I've been in that position where I, I've realized, uh, I don't think you're being completely honest with me. And that's when you part ways and say, thanks for your time. But uh, I've got more important things to do with people who, who want to really know what's going on. I, I give you a lot of credit for doing that. And I'm obviously the, uh, stick to and diligence you've put into examining these cases, realizing that you've been lied to in the past. Do you ever confront them when you find out that there was a lie to find out what they hope to gain by doing that? Or what were they, what was their involvement in this and why? Oh, absolutely. I mean, everyone who I, and again, these aren't the people in the book are the people who I've narrowed down and vetted and, uh, you know, really put my trust into for the books. I mean, I collectively, I probably interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people um, and had to really narrow it down to the most credible, the most verifiable, the ones with other witnesses involved, stuff like that. And for the ones who I kind of distanced myself from because I didn't, I didn't have that gut feeling uh, that they were being completely honest with me. Uh, yeah, I'd approach them and be like, why did you do this? And most of the time, Dave, like they would uh, just say, well, it's my truth. And that's that. And then others just straight up ghosted me, man. Like they never talked to me again. And that's fine. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do want to know the intention of someone who comes forward with something like this uh, and maybe fabricates or stuff like that. And um, most of the time they just disappear out of sight. Um, but, you know, it's hard. Has and it's there ever been one of those that you stood back from and, stood, and, yeah. and, and said, you know, I, I don't buy the story. And then only later to find out, oh, wow, there's more people coming forward. That's a story I should have included. Not specifically. I wish I had like some, you know, scandalous story like that. But um, no, I haven't been in the situation where I said, you're full of it. And then come to find out it was real. It's usually the opposite, unfortunately, for me. But um, again, that's just me. And I mean, there's so many investigators and researchers out there who uh, thought cases were not on the up and up. And then they turned out to be real and more people came forward. So again, I think that that mentality of always being able to change your mind is so important when it comes to this. And uh, and yeah, that's a journey I'm still willing to take in terms of uh, building a trust again, for sure. Well, let's let's reopen the case files. Let's talk about some of your favorite cases from the first version of the book and what you've been able to uncover since. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some cases in both versions that um, that really hold a place in my heart. And um, one of the ones that really always comes to mind for me is a gentleman named Scott, a retired uh, Coast Guard worker and Postal Service worker. Uh, and this event happened or 
pretty long time ago. This has happened in 74, but it's one of the most amazing stories I've heard where uh, Scott and a buddy of his, they were going to a drive-in theater in um, Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. And, you know, they drive, they get there, they get into the parking lot, um, having a smoke or whatever, waiting for the movie to start. And then all of a sudden, all the power in the entire complex just goes out in the parking lot. The movie screen goes black. Everyone's like, what's going on? You know, the power must have went out. So some people are like, all right, let's get out of here. And they start to they try to start their cars and nobody's cars would start. So you've got like this close encounters of the third kind thing sort of going on. And some people start getting scared or whatnot. And um, Scott and his buddy are just like, what do we do? Like, <laughs> Should we like try to see what's going on? And the minute Scott gets out of his car, this huge object comes over the movie screen. And he said as it floated over the parking lot, From tip to tip, this thing was massive. It covered the entire parking lot above them. It was chevron-shaped. It was completely black, no appendages, no signs of propulsion, nothing. And it just floated over the parking lot and then over a field in the distance and then disappeared. And he said right when the thing disappeared out of sight, all the power came back on in the theater. And the movie started. And, you know, you would think that People would be talking about what just happened. But all Scott remembers, Dave, is he uh, he goes to the restroom, waits in line, and nobody's talking about just what happened. Nobody. And then he gets in the car, and they watch the entire movie and go home. And he didn't remember this event happening until years after when he saw like a UFO book or something at a bookstore, and it triggered this memory. And that was like astounding for me it was like some sort of instant amnesia where he blacked out and couldn't remember this thing happening but apparently neither could anyone else because no one was talking about it after it happened and that really struck me as um a unique case where something seemed to be in control of people's thoughts or emotions and even memory at the time of this and uh I struggled with this one, man, because apparently there are hundreds of people there and only this one guy is coming to me and saying this happened. So that was really tough. You know, I I I tried to find out everything I could about the movie theater. I went to the local newspapers and tried to see if any articles had been written about this event. Nothing, nothing. Obviously, the drive in theater has gone, you know, at this point, but I couldn't find anything. So this entire thing rested on this one guy's shoulders and I had to decide, like, you know, do I do I trust him or not? And um, I did. I mean, he was so genuine in this and was constantly coming back to me with small fragments of memories from that night. And uh, in the new edition of the book, actually, I revisited his case to see if anything had evolved. And lo and behold, I got an email probably about six months ago or so from a woman whose boyfriend worked at that drive in theater at the time. They lived a town over and they saw the thing. Supposedly, it was the same exact thing, the way she described it to me and everything. So, boom. I mean, I had some corroboration right there that Scott wasn't the only one who experienced this, um, you know, and he could rest knowing that he he wasn't a liar. He didn't make this up. And this this thing happened. So, yeah, that was one of the ones that really stuck out to me from the first book that evolved into the second book. You you look at a case like that that sounds so profound, so hard to believe in shaking that. Have you ever considered writing or getting in touch with the newspapers in that area now to talk about this case, see if it reignites a memory like his memory was lit up by seeing a book on UFOs? If, if, if an article appeared in their newspaper or on their local news, would that remind people of this? That's uh, I'm so happy you asked me that. Yes. Yes, I have. I've reached out to local news stations and everything, and I said, hey, you, you had one of the most dramatic UFO sightings I've ever come across in my research. And uh, they're slowly, clearly, people are starting to come forward. Uh, this one, Scott, and, uh, and yeah, I, I'm actually working with a local reporter there, whether it's in print or online or on like the, the news. Uh, we're working on something. And Scott's story has now been featured in a, a brand new book as well, 
by a UFO researcher, Preston Dennett, literally called UFOs at the drive-in. And that blew my mind, man. Like, I thought I had the one unique case of a drive-in movie theater UFO sighting. This guy compiled hundreds of these events. So there's got to be something to that, too. So I'm also working with Preston on uh, trying to figure out what is it about these drive-in movie theaters and these UFOs. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because it's got so many people in the zone staring at a movie screen. Their minds have already kind of checked out. The aliens know if they make their approach do this, people are going to be surprised, shocked, see it, but they might be more willing to, I guess, be manipulated into mm-hmm. forgetting or, or you know, um, easy pickings for abductions or some kind of testing. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. That's a really good point, man. And I mean, I that that seems to be another thing with a lot of these UFO cases, these mass UFO sightings like the Phoenix Lights and and things of that nature is begging for our attention. I mean, these aren't like little elusive craft zipping in and disappearing within seconds. These things are floating over major cities and they're begging to be seen. So you do have to wonder why. Do they want to gauge our reactions? Are they there for a reason? And Scott told me, at least with his event, um, he thinks that they wanted to be seen and they wanted to see how they could control the memories of these people who are experiencing it. And that goes back to the early work of people like Jacques Vallée, the UFO researcher and astronomer and computer scientist who, who came up with these theories of the control system, you know, whether it's the UFO itself or the occupants within it, uh, that they can manipulate our emotions or our thoughts or even our memories. And that's very fascinating and uh, extremely alarming, too, if you really think about it. It really is. But what a what an intriguing story. You know, as you're telling me this, I don't want to sound like I'm cashing in. I seem to recall maybe 15 years ago, I was at the um, theater, drive-in theater here in Minnesota, and I seem to recall seeing a light fly up over the top of, of a drive-in movie screen. <laughs> there I you go, man. To, I'm not joking with you. I swear, I, I kind of, that's like triggered this memory, but that's wow. all I remember. That's that's why I'm here. We were meant to have this conversation, man. I, we're going to unravel this story piece by piece. But that's amazing. See, see that sometimes that's all it takes is a, a trigger word or um, huh. the smallest thing to bring these things forward. Yeah, that is very bizarre. Interesting, uh, to say the least. I mean, that is that's a really uh, out there story. But again, you know, wh- when are we our most mindless when we're engaged in something entertaining? And yeah. Either that or, or the aliens were just dicks and wanted the best parking spot for a drive-in theater again. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, cool stuff. All right. So in now, is that a case that you revisit again for yourself in the new uh, edition? Yeah, yeah. Um, Scott has different ideas of, um, you know, what it could have been and 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 like what it was trying to convey. And also, you know, just that email I got sent was probably the biggest development in the story of finding another witness. And that's more important to me than anything, to be honest, is finally, finally, he, he can say he's not alone in this. So yes, that is one I revisit, um, as well as many, many others. All right. Uh, before we take a break, let's go into another one of your more, what would sound outlandish stories, but is really compelling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Another one that really sticks out to me is um, a woman in Michigan. Uh, And this happened back in 2005. A woman named Patty, she uh, she lived right off of uh, a lake out there. Um, And she remembers one night she's bringing her dogs out, take them for a nightly walk, and they won't leave the porch. And this has never happened before. They looked timid. They looked scared. Just wondering what's going on. Is there like someone out there or something? And uh, she goes down in the porch, kind of scopes out the area, doesn't see anything out of the ordinary until she looks up. And right above her is a triangular UFO, you know, this typical three white lights, red light in the middle sort of thing. And uh, she's just watching this thing hang silently. And she is just astounded in awe, as anyone would be. And she's like, am I... Like, am I imagining this? So she screams for her daughter inside, like, come out here, come out here. So her daughter comes out and Patty says, look up. Do you see this? She's like, yeah, 
Yes, I see it. And they're both looking up at this thing, Dave. And the mother is telling the daughter, like, oh, my God, it's so beautiful. I'm in awe. This is amazing. She told me she felt euphoric during the whole thing. And she turns to her daughter and she's like, wow, I can't believe it's just it's silent. And it's just hanging there. And she looks over and her daughter is on the ground in the fetal position, covering her ears and telling her mom, I can't stand this. It's so loud. I, 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 it's, I feel like my, my eardrums are going to burst. And she was terrified. So in that moment, you have the mother having him, the most incredible, awe-inspiring moment of her life. And the daughter is petrified and says how unbearably loud it is. And that, again, it, it seems that whatever they're looking at had some sort of control over their perception of it. I mean, apparently they're staring up at the same thing, but the daughter says it's unbearably loud. The mom said it was silent. And it was just, again, that, that was a case where when she brought that little piece to me, it gave me chills. I'm like, what is going on here? How are these things controlling us? And I mean, that was just, that opened the doors wide open for this family, Dave. I mean, they, after this event, you know, the triangle, it eventually zips out, out of sight. Um, this family had high, high strangeness events happen after this. I mean, we're talking like poltergeist activity in the house, things flying off the shelves and whatnot, power going out. Uh, the electrical company came to fix their power one day after some reason it went out. And the electrical guy is doing his thing near the house and he sees a UFO above the house and he packs up and he gets the hell out of there. And... Oh, man, it, it just it keeps going. It keeps unraveling. Their other daughter has shadow people experiences in the home. Um, small creatures are being sighted around the house and in the house and everything in between. So it seemed like whatever this UFO was, this initiation experience, as I've called it, opened the doors wide open for just every sort of phenomena to occur to this family, man. And it just like. I don't want to say it was good because it definitely kind of tore the family apart. Like they didn't know how to deal with any of this and um, really tore them up. And that was heartbreaking for me. I mean, they didn't speak the daughters and the mom for years after these events happened. Eventually, they came back together and just talked about it. And now they're still working through it up until today. But wow, man. And I had the I had the opportunity to finally meet Patty in Michigan like a year ago. And like without even a word, she just came up and hugged me. And I just told her, like, I'm so happy you came to me with this because it's one of the most incredible events I've ever heard. And you you've shown, I think, the world at this point that like it's OK. It's OK to talk about these things and it's OK to not understand them. And uh, I'm still working with her up until today to try to piece this thing together, you know. That's really remarkable. Yeah. It's sad to yeah. see that it tore the family apart. But what do you make of the multiple claims of what was going on? The place-like activity, the, the creatures. Do you think that – now, hear me out on this. Mm -hmm. Many of these craft are believed to be magnetic Right. In the way that they're able to travel, because yeah. it really seems to be the only way that under you can understand their propulsion systems or lack of propulsion systems, that they're somehow manipulating magnetics. Could that magnetic resonance be creating um, what we think is is paranormal activity, uh, creating the, the vibration that would make things fall and seem poltergeist like an activity or create paranoia and hallucinations because they're there or. You know, is is this part of the Petri dish the aliens have created with this family to stimulate the fear element and see how much somebody is able to take, what they're able to take? Yeah, I mean, I spoke to probably the most prominent uh, triangular UFO researcher out there, considering this case all started with a triangle. I asked this guy, I'm like, what's up with the lights on these things? I mean... So many people have reported these triangular UFOs as having the three white lights and that weird hazy red light in the middle, um, myself included. I saw one of these things when I was a kid, uh, just a formation. I didn't see like a, a machine or a structure to it, but I saw those lights. 
And I asked him, I'm, and I get asked this too a lot, Dave, is why do UFOs have lights if they travel this far and they're this highly advanced? Why do they need like lights? And, um, you know, I talked to David Marler, the researcher, and asked his opinion on that. And I never really thought about this. He said, maybe the lights are actually the propulsion system of some sort. That's how these things are seem to electromagnetically propel themselves. And maybe that power, that technology, that, uh, you know, invisible force is also what controls us back here on the ground. I mean, we have such weird reactions when it comes to electromagnetism and whatnot. So I do wonder, you know, is it a, a propulsion system for these craft and B, can it control us? And, um, I don't know, man. I, I, again, like anyone who pretends to know any of these things, uh, <laughs> they don't. They don't, but we can pose theories, and I think that's what's most important. And I can never pretend to know the intentions of these these entities or intelligences behind these things, but there has to be something to it. I, I don't think, you know, this singular UFO event followed by all this paranormal activity was just a fluke. I honestly think somehow, some way, all of these phenomena are connected by some sort of weird string theory. And I think we're only beginning to scratch the surface of that. Somewhere in the skies, a human approach to the UFO phenomenon, the new edition with updated stories and tales and follow-ups to many of his uh, most famous interviews from the first book is out. We have a link for that book on today's program guide. Ryan Sprague, our guest, will continue with more right after this on Darkness Radio. We're back. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm Dave Schrader. That's Tim Dennis. This, this wonderful place you're visiting is the darkness on the edge of town. Darkness radio. You can hear us every Wednesday and Thursday with brand new editions of the best in paranormal talk radio every Tuesday with true crime Tuesday, all part of the family here so that you can subscribe, get all that you need in one place. That's right. You can get it all in one place. It's amazing. And you can get it commercial free on our premium versions, or you can listen to the commercial editions of each episode. All right, Ryan, let's, uh, let's dive back in. Great story so far. Uh, now we've tackled some of the stories you covered in the past. What are a couple of the new stories we can explore? And, and there's a lot in this book folks. So just giving away a couple of them each is not going to ruin the book experience for you. <laughs> what, what are yeah. some of the newer stories that you uh, you uncover in this uh, in the new uh, edition? I, I'm happy you said that, Dave. I mean, the new edition is almost eighty thousand new words, so I probably should have just written a new book. But but it is what it is. But no, I do bring new cases forward as well in um, a few new chapters, and one of them that really stuck out to me and is very recent, you know, which I think is important too. Um, you know, a lot of these cases we hear about are from the 50s, 60s, 70s. It's like, yeah, OK, that's great and everything. But like what's happening now? And this one came to me as early as last year. And um, this happened to a guy named Eric and back in 2019 in uh, in Michigan as well. And this one's really interesting. So, Eric, he he actually is a pioneer in um, gemology. And rocks, studying rocks. And this guy, he discovered a brand new sort of rock in Michigan that had never been sighted there before. And he's termed these things euperlites. And it's it's pretty cool. It's these bioluminescent rocks, basically, that um, we believe came down from Canada. And the way that they, where they originated and the way they made their way down to Michigan and everything, they have some weird chemical composition where when it turns dark, these rocks actually glow and pulsate. They're beautiful. And uh, he captured worldwide attention with these things and scientific journals and whatnot. And, you know, what did he do? He started a touring business like any good entrepreneur would when they make a discovery like this. So people all over the world started coming to Michigan to try to look for these euperlites, you know, like as hobbyists and gemologists and whatnot. And he'd bring them out to the beaches where where these things occurred. And uh, the most prominent place for these rocks was a place called Whitefish Point off of Lake Superior. And uh, one night, 
back in 2019, he brought a group of three people out to look for these things on the beach. And they're kind of packing up for the night. They got their rocks. It started raining. So they're like, let's get out of here. And one of the women on the touring group, she notices something out over the water. She's like, what is that? And Eric was just like, oh, it's probably like probably a helicopter or something. Um, you know, th- those things are over the water all the time. She's like, no, it's it's just kind of like just staying there. And there's another and another. And all of a sudden, all these orange orb like things started appearing over the water. And again, Eric's trying to come up with any conventional explanation. You know, maybe it's a ship and uh, it's the lights on the ship. It's hazy. We can't see the ship. She's like, no. Like, look over there. That's a ship. And they look to the left. And yeah, lo and behold, there is a ship out there. But to the right of this, there are these now four to five orbs, orange orbs floating over the water. And again, he's just trying to tick everything off the box. Chinese lanterns, drones, blah, blah, blah. But they were not acting like anything conventional. And as they're looking at these things, Dave, one of the the orange orbs, it actually leaves the line of orbs and shoots to the beach, like within breakneck speeds, they say, and hovered right above them. And they're terrified. You know, one of the women like jumped behind a boulder. She was so scared. And they're just watching this thing hover above them. And it just hovers, hovers, hovers. And then it shoots back out to the water and rejoins the other group of lights. And this goes on for like 25 minutes where one light would come over them, go back out. One light would come, go back out. And they videotaped this. Like, he got a lot of footage of this. Uh, I think it was shared first with the New York Post. And uh, you can find it online. Um, I I can get you some links for that. But we have video evidence. And then we have a corroborating story between four independent witnesses that I interviewed about what happened. But what ended up happening, Dave, is they... uh, they watch these things. It goes back out to the water, whatnot. The one woman was so terrified. She said, get us the hell out of here. And he he drives them back to their truck, you know, a couple miles away. And he's like, I'm not done. Like, I want to know what this is. So he goes back by himself to that beach and he just parks, you know, looking out over the water. Lights are still there, which, again, is rare. Sometimes these things only are seen for seconds. This thing's going on for like 40 minutes where he's just watching and he's flashing his headlights at these things and they're responding. A light comes over his truck, goes back out. They start pulsating this, that, this, that. And he said he had like a game with these things for 45 minutes or so when finally they just disappeared out of sight. And man, this, this was like this. I, I couldn't dream of a better case. We had video evidence. We had four witnesses independently told me their stories and they all were so accurate and so precise. It was amazing. And it just changed this guy. Like he never thought twice about UFOs before. And now he's like in the world embedded, like trying to figure this stuff out. Um, And I'll I'll add just this sort of in his addendum to end the story. Uh, The ship that was out over the water, like I wanted to know, were they a part of this? Did they have something to do with it? And I worked with Eric, the witness, to see if we could get in touch with them. And we did. We got in touch with the the captain of the ship that night. This was a ship that made a, a weekly round right in this area. And we called and we got in touch and said, hey, this night, what the hell were those lights? Did you guys have anything to do with that? And all they would say is, we have no comment on the incident. And we were like, uh, hmm, okay. Like, well, so they weren't yours. You had nothing to do with it. Did you have, you know, you had to have had logs on the ship or anything recording this. And they said, all they told us was, we do not have video of the incident that night. We have no comment. So we thought that was interesting. You know, we, we thought, you know, maybe even to get a response would have been amazing. But the response they gave us was so weird. You know, we have no comment on the incident. So they admitted there was an incident, but were they a part of it? We'll truly never know, but we're trying to work with them still to figure out what that was, what their vantage point was of it, and if they have any more further enlightenment on the incident. So I'm working with Eric still up until this day on this case. It's just amazing. Do you ever get threats from anybody uh, anonymously or not so much for revealing this information? I've... (sighs) I've been nudged to not look into certain things. I wish 
I wish Dave, like that, that's when I know I've made it. If I get like those, you know, those, those phone calls or people tapping my phones, but I, I wish it were that exciting, but I, there have been times in the past where I've looked into certain things or spoken to military individuals who, uh, who said this conversation should not go any further. Um, but you know, it's a, you got to take that for what it's worth. And I've gotten anonymous emails saying, stop what you're doing and this, but who knows? Could be a prank, uh, but but no, man. I mean, that's not going to stop me. And again, these things are, this is for the public to know, I, I at least in my opinion. So if I can get the cases out there, uh, I think I've contributed something to the overall conversation. And look, we live in a post-New York Times disclosure world now where military people are feeling more empowered than ever to come forward. And I have a brand new chapter in the book about one of the most famous too so look if they're coming forward anyone can do you ever and i just curious about this you know i don't know if i've ever i'm sure i've asked it of, of some of our past guests but let me hear it from your perspective do you ever worry that by pushing this agenda getting it out there what if this really is just our own military and these are test craft they don't want the rest of the world to know about because in the event that god forbid something happens and we are attacked again they want to have the military upper hand. And by talking about this, it might be slowly revealing to our enemies what we truly are capable of. Yeah, uh, that is a valid concern. And the way I look at it is uh, up to the recent stuff happening where we have the Senate Intelligence Committee, you know, drafting a bill where. They're creating a UFO task force in the Pentagon to look at this stuff again and to reveal some stuff to the public. But I'm sure most of it will remain classified. And I understand that entire aspect of all of this. You know, a lot of the stuff the government or the military might know is held secret and is, you know, unacknowledged in black budget programs for a reason. And I get that. Uh, for me, however, you know, they're there's an aspect to all this that doesn't seem to be military. And I, I like to focus on that. Um, but I can't say. I'm sure, you know, what I saw as a kid, what a lot of other people have seen throughout the years, was some sort of top secret military thing going on. And uh, I get that. And maybe, you know, these things hovering over drive-in theaters or being sighted over Phoenix in 1996, uh, maybe they wanted to see if the public did see it. You know, as their stealth technology increases within the military, let's see how many people report this, having seen this. So, uh, yeah, I, I think there is an aspect to all this where they're probably not happy that a lot of people are looking into the more military aspect to this and military people coming forward and seeing stuff over their bases and whatnot. But um, it's interesting. And we know for a fact that uh, UFO researchers in the past have been monitored by intelligence agencies. Uh, I, I think of someone like John Greenwald, the gentleman who created the Black Vault website with thousands of declassified files on UFOs from the government and whatnot. And uh, he he's able to see where people are visiting the site from. And man, he has so many intelligence individuals within the Pentagon and the FBI looking at his website every day. And we also know that these individuals have been seen at UFO conferences throughout the years, because you, you have to keep in mind too, some of these people coming forward are military and talking about these things. And it might have been something that was classified. So they do keep tabs on people. I have absolutely no doubt. And, you know, for me personally, I know back uh, a couple years ago, I was speaking to a geologist in Roswell who claimed to have material from the Roswell UFO crash. And I went out to Roswell to look at these things, and I got them analyzed in an aerospace lab. And we know for a fact, and he discovered this, that the FBI was monitoring our Facebook conversations, and he has screenshots of sh such. And he got these through a FOIA request from the uh, Freedom of Information Act. And uh, they were monitoring what we were saying because we were out at a site that is now government-owned, I might say. They bought up the land where the Roswell UFO crash happened. So that's telling you something. And they wanted to know what he had. And they confiscated the materials at one point. So, I mean, it's crazy, man. Yes, yes, they do 
probably wish a lot of us weren't talking about some aspects of all this. But on the flip side of that, too, I think when you have a lot of people talking about aliens and this is all extraterrestrial and a hundred different races visiting our planet in different types of craft. Meanwhile, it is a top secret project that the government's working on and they're probably like, go with it. Let them keep, keep feeding that alien story. Um, so yeah, there's, there's two sides to every coin, right? So I think it's, it's pretty fascinating. I wonder, has anybody ever come forward where somebody from the military is talking about a test that they were doing with their stealth craft when, in fact, they were visited then by something? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, here they are doing what they're doing, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, one of the uh, aliens or or something starts taking notice of them. Have you had anything like that cross you? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the most recent one is the 2004 Nimitz event, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners are kind of familiar with that by now, but I, uh, I spoke personally to the radar operator at the time of that event, and he was the first to track these UFOs, these Tic Tac UFOs, and, you know, we see this video circulating from the Navy of this one Tic Tac shaped UFO, and uh, that's great. You know, we, we have video. It's officially been released by the DOD and the Navy, but we don't know the story behind it. And until these military people came forward to talk about it, yeah, we had no context. And now we're getting the story slowly but surely. And now, up until today, several UFO researchers, uh, a gentleman named Tim, Tim McMillan in specific that I've spoken to, has gotten some interesting information from people involved that possibly we were housing nuclear ordnance of some sort on these ships out there. And that these Tic Tacs, whatever they were, were interested in those capabilities. And we've heard hundreds of cases now where UFOs have been sighted over nuclear facilities. But, you know, in this event specifically, the UFO shows up during a training mission with Top Gun fighter pilots. So you have to wonder... Was it another branch of the military testing the Navy? Or was it a legitimate extraterrestrial craft coming in because this ship had nuclear weapons or ordnance, I should say, and uh, wanted to see what was going on? I, I can't tell you, but it's it's slowly unraveling. And I think we're going to we're going to find out some interesting things about that specific case very soon. It is intriguing to me that in a post 9-11 world, these Aliens keep seeming to buzz some of our most uh, highly classified or highly um, secured locations. And why aren't we engaging more? Is it out of fear that they're just going to disintegrate us? <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I wish we had more answers on on that aspect. And maybe that's why the military is taking effect. Because, listen, if if they can effectively shut down our nuclear capabilities, if planes start engaging them over nuclear sites – and they just shut off the planes, does that take a chance of dropping the planes and causing explosions that you don't want having near a a nuclear facility? Absolutely. That is a huge concern. And I think, you know, we we have to keep in mind that, yeah, these are the most, the smartest and most talented fighter pilots in the world that are engaging these UFOs, yet they're human. And they, they have to make snap judgments and decisions on how to react to something in the skies. And when you have these pilots saying, I didn't know what to do, and I didn't know how to outmaneuver it, I didn't know how to pursue it, I didn't know if I should fire or not, or straight up my weapon system went down when I was in proximity to this thing, that is terrifying, no matter how you look at it. And I don't even think the military... I should say, you know, these pilots are looking at it as the UFO is malevolent and wants to fight it and destroy it or anything like that. I think it's our human reaction to these events, Dave, that uh, pose the biggest threat. They don't know what to do. There is no protocol on how to uh, chase a UFO, (laughs) you know, and we've we've had incidents where pilots have um, pursued these things and have crashed and their weapon systems went down and it, it's terrifying. It's terrifying that these UFOs, no matter what their intentions are, they don't even know, um, some of them probably how they're affecting us. And like you said, 
it would take just a moment for one of our planes to go down and crash into this nuclear facility or for one person to make the wrong judgment and push fire on that thing. So, yeah, yeah, it's terrifying when you really think of it. And it's also alarming how many cases there are. We're talking hundreds and hundreds of cases all over the world of UFOs affecting nuclear ordnance. And, uh, oh, man, that if that doesn't send a message, I don't know what does. Tim, I've got to ask you, um, is it interesting to you that the only time we really have guests are breaking up mechanically on the phone is UFO guests? Yeah. Oh, no. I, yeah. I find that intriguing. Yeah. And it's it's generally right when they're hitting the apex of their information that I just... Uh, 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 <laughs> oh, no. I'm yeah. sorry, guys. No, it's not your fault. It's our damn shadow government trying to shut Tim and I down <laughs> from telling the truth to the peoples. The peoples, I'm Tim. I'm uh... I'm at an undisclosed location off the mainland, so I'm sure that has something to do with it, too. <laughs> oh, good. So the a- aliens are intercepting as well to try to figure out what's being told. You know, I've thrown it out there to uh, to this because we have had many people, um, while we're interviewing them, we start having strange phenomena like uh, audio interruptions take place. You just feel free to call me uh, or call Tim at 612 <laughs> Well, well, Tim, I just figured the government could call you and talk to you and we could get them on the show. <laughs> no, is, that's six one two. I don't need the four, government calling me. No, that's oh, fine. <laughs> no, oh, just trying to make make the world a better place, Tim. No. Um, but you know how to contact us. Come on. You know, we're listed in your super black book. Just reach out to Tim and I and tell us, you know, uh, we want to know what's what's really going on with UFOs. Um, it sounds like I'm joking. I'm not, I'd, I'd love for one of these people like you, you say when you're on the right path, you're going to get threatened and you kind of would relish that, although it would be terrifying altogether. Uh, yeah. Ryan, it would also be kind of exciting to have uh, something like that take place. Uh, I'm all about having Tim threatened when we're getting too close to the truth. So feel free, uh, whoever's listening, threaten Tim. If we're, if we're getting too close, <laughs> that's mighty white. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Well, you know what? This is the way I look at it. Uh, you can't make an egg without, cra- or you can't make an omelet without cracking a few eggs. And uh, Tim, I'm willing to make that omelet if it means that we get the truth mm-hmm. at your expense. That's all I'm mm-hmm. saying. I'm just putting it out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ryan, what uh, what else have you got for us in the new book that uh, that you think people will really? I don't know. You know, for people that have been following ufology and all of the the strange claims, what do you feel is something that really kind of uh, might even set this apart as something people just have never heard of this type of experience before. Ah, uh, man, there's, there's so many, so, so many. Um, there's, there's another one and I, I hope I, I don't break up at this one. Um, a, a former MUFON field investigator, you know, the mutual UFO network, a civilian run organization that will investigate your UFO claims and encounters. Uh, at one point, Back in 2010, they had this rapid response team who you call, and if a UFO event's happening, they'll try to dispatch someone as close to you as possible to to catch it in the act. And uh, for this one woman, Chase Kletsky, she uh, she went out to an event in Tennessee back in 2010. Oh, sure. We've had, this guy, we've had Chase on the show. She's great. Oh, Go ahead. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, this she's done amazing things. You know, she worked for Homeland Security at one point and uh, just an incredible investigator. So no BS with her. And that's what really made this story stand out when she told me it, because it's it's crazy. Uh, So she goes out to this this farm area where this guy claimed all these UFOs were being sighted over his house. And he was petrified, absolutely petrified. He didn't know what was going on. Um, He had a lot of land and these things seemed to be really interested in just his property. So Chase gets out there with her investigative partner, you know, handshakes, hi, hello. And he said, no time for like introductions. It's happening right now. So he gets them in his truck and he brings them out to this cornfield where most of the events were happening. And they're they get out there. They're amongst all this corn. And Chase starts setting up all our equipment, our cameras and um you know, all our little gadgets and gizmos to try to record these things. And of course, just like in the paranormal world, Dave, every thing died. Batteries started draining. Nothing would turn on. And she's pissed. She's like, you got to be kidding me. Like, I'm in an active investigation. And really? What's what? And uh, while she's trying to get everything going, um, these lights hovering above them, they get closer, closer and closer until she 
is it's not separated lights. It's actually a triangular UFO. So we have another triangular UFO case. And this thing hovers above them and then darts out of sight. And uh, Chase said that all three of them, the witness and the two investigators, unspoken to one another, had this immediate feeling of a threat. Like they had to get out of there. So they kind of pack up and they start to leave that area and see if they can find anything else going on. And again, something made all three of them, without saying anything, just start running out of this field. So they are sprinting out of this field. And then all of a sudden, Chase crashes into the back of the witness who was leading them, falls over, you know, gathers herself, gets up. And all she hears is the witness say, what the F is that? And she looks over the guy's shoulder and right there in front of them for a very brief moment, they all saw a small being staring at them. Gray, big head, black eyes, just staring right at them. And then it disappears. And they didn't know what the hell to do. Bolted out of there again, got into the truck go back to the guy's house and he's just, he's a mess. He's as white as a ghost. He's crying. And, um, he's just asked him, what, what is that? What is going on? What is going on? And chase, she didn't know what to say. Like as a very skeptical investigator, who's able to keep her composure in the most, uh, you know, unsettling of situations. She didn't know what to tell him. She became a part of the case it was everything all at once, a triangle, a being in the, you know, in the, uh, in the field. And she said, she just told him, I don't know. I don't know. And man, they went back out later that night. Nothing. Everything was gone. They had other investigators go out after that to see if everything was still happening. And yeah, lights were seen over there, but that being never made a return and she didn't know what to make of it. And it's a case that shakes her to the core up until today where she said it is the hardest thing as an investigator to remain biased when you have become a part of it. The narrative of, I saw it. I saw a goddamn being in the middle of a field. Ah, right. <laughs> oh, man. So that yeah, one trying to be an I, objective skeptic that kind of, that takes a lot of the, the guesswork out of it for you. Tell me about it, like right in your face, man. So, yeah, that's tough for her. But again, it, it really shows like no matter how hard you may try to uh, to explain something away, it's going to just yell in your face. I'm here. Look at me. Something's going on. Is there any chance she had been out earlier that night with Miley Cyrus picking up some wax weed from a guy <laughs> in a van? It's very possible, man. Hey, her and uh, Demi Lovato and Miley were just, uh, <laughs> they were crunking that night. Oh, <laughs> no, just kidding. Get, get, get complete and utter respect to all of the uh, the people having these experiences. Uh, wow, that that is, that's really, you know, when, again, that's just one of those you can't summarily dismiss. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. All these things aren't happening. That's something very compelling. And and to take an investigator who I, I really respect, Chase, is very serious about this work. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. I mean, how does she feel about it at this point? Does she regret the turning and running? Does she, you know, what? that's mm -hmm. that's human. And let me just tell all of you right now, shaking your head and saying, I would have gone up and interviewed. Ah, BS. I'd slap you in the mouth if you told me that in person. It's so easy to sit on your couch at home and tell me how smart and intelligent you would be in these situations. Uh, listen, being on the, on the Holzer Files, uh, I, I've, I've watched Paranormal TV since it really kind of kicked off in 2006. And I can tell you, I've been that guy thinking, oh, I would never run, dude. I would never take until you're in that position. You don't know what you would do. You like to think you know what you do. But that isn't yeah. the case. And when you get that, everybody's screaming and freaking out. That that's got to be something that sets you off. <laughs> Dave, I, I I'm so happy you said that, man. Because that was my first question for her. I'm like, you you had a close encounter of like the third kind, and you ran. And so many people have have asked her that. Like, are you kidding me? I would have done this. I would have done this. And like you said, man, you know better than anyone. I remember that time you got pushed by you know an invisible force and right. i was like trying to put myself in your shoes and i'm like Holy. i wish i wish somebody else had been in my shoes right my back is still not <laughs> quite right after that 
Right. Um, you know, well, you bring up a good point, though. We weren't there when this happened. And that's kind of my mentality with all of this. I can't I can't explain what happened to an individual because I was not there when it happened. And that's what I that's what I say when people say, do you honestly believe this or that people are being abducted by aliens, this, that. And I tell them this person does and it's their truth. And I'm not going to take that away from them. I can't. I'm very skeptical, extremely skeptical when it comes to all of this. But I was not there when the event happened. Nobody was there when I saw a UFO except my father, who also saw it. So I guess I do have a corroborating witness for me. But a lot of people don't have that luxury. So, yeah, man, if you weren't there, you can't say what you would have done. And Chase also, going back to this control system, said what made us feel like we had to run out of that field at that moment? None of us could explain that. So something was controlling their emotions at that point. So, uh, okay. man, I don't know. Sure. And, and here, again, that's that magnetic resonance. If there's a craft nearby that's creating a magnetic resonance, look it up. Uh, infrasound, whatever you know, might be projected from this, c- causes uh, extreme anxiety and fear in some people. So that yeah. would make sense why you would suddenly scramble right exactly. I, yep. I i don't know i again just something to kind of to mull about and and chew on um you you hear stories like this you hear these places that are so um rich with with history of what took place there some places seem to really own it and they celebrate it and they have ufo days in their town others shun it what have you noticed about the way people accept it, that human element. You look at something like Roswell, this small town that, uh, honestly, and, and I, I hate saying this, probably wouldn't have survived throughout the decades if not for that famous UFO event. I mean, they have a festival that draws thousands of people every year, and it's a huge source of income for that town. And yeah, you have other places like this. You've got the Exeter Festival in New Hampshire. You've got tons of these examples all over the world where a town embraces the events that happened and and others that don't. And um, I think there's something to be said for that. And it really speaks, I think, to the larger sociological aspect of all of this. Like we all want to believe, I think, at the end of the day, those who don't want to believe that aliens are visiting us or that these phenomena are actually occurring i think it's just a deep-seated fear of the unknown and that's completely understandable in my opinion and you have every right to feel that way but a lot of people don't have that luxury because they have stared a being in the face or they have been pushed by a ghost or or had a triangle hover over their home so um again i i think it says a lot about us as people that we we enjoy mystery. We enjoy things we can't explain because it's, it, it fuels us. That's what keeps me going, man. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to figure out what UFOs are or aren't at the end of the day. And there's probably no singular answer. Well, not with that queer but attitude, that Sprague. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? I know. People, well, I get asked that question all the time. Like, if you got the answers, what then? And that's when I tell them the work's only begun. Like, Honestly, we have the U.S. government acknowledging UFOs exist in 2020, 2017, whatever. Um, And that's a huge step. They've denied it for so long. And now the real questions have to be asked. Who are they? What are they? What do they want? The military is going to look at that as a potential threat. I'm going to look at it and interview the, the hundreds of thousands of civilian witnesses having these experiences and get their thoughts on it, too, because they have every right to have an opinion on this as well. So, um, yeah, I, I think going back to your your point of like these towns that may that maybe embrace or deny it, it really depends. And I think for those who embrace these experiences in their lives, it's extremely rewarding and it opens them up to things they might never have thought about. And for those who deny it, that's fine, too. I've had some people who are willing to share their story with me and then never, ever talk about it again. And I, I understand both sides of it for sure. Do you feel like it was cathartic for them to just want to get it out, talk to somebody who would listen, not roll their eyes, but take them seriously? And once they said it, it was like, all right, I got it out of my system. This is how it went down. Take it or leave it. That's my story. Totally. I mean, that's why I do it. At the end of the day, I, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, 
I'm a playwright. I will sit in a bar or, you know, anywhere in the corner and just listen to people's conversations because oh, that, I have that, that's to. Creep, that's creepy. It is man. creepy, man. It's hey, very creepy. I, I've probably been uh, kicked out more than I probably should have. But uh, yeah, that, that, that image of me in a corner creeping is a little weird. Maybe uh, let's cut that out if you don't mind. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, can't, man. can't be any worse in my experience of standing out front of a uh, uh, so, um, uh, Starbucks playing Pokemon on my phone when yeah. two attractive women walk past me and I'm moving my phone and they go in and complain to the manager that I'm out front taking pictures of them. <laughs> and he came, came up and, and confronted me. And I said, uh, no, I'm, I'm playing Pokemon go. And he said, Oh, I think that's worse. And <laughs> walked inside. So I, I got mocked and ridiculed because I wasn't taking pictures of oh, uh, people, young women. I was playing, I was nerding out and playing Pokemon go. So right, it's uh, almost six of one half a dozen of the other. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, great stuff. Now, these experiences, how many of them actually involve seeing beings as opposed to just the craft? Yeah. So, I mean, the first portion of both editions of the book really cover everything. I, I try to go and kind of of an escalating uh, structure, you know, where I start with just simple lights in the sky and the book ends with abductions and everything in between. And so I'd say, you know, probably 50% of the book are claims of either having had a close encounter with a being or being abducted. And uh, uh, it's astounding, the staggering amount of people throughout the years, still up until today, uh, having these experiences with beings. And again, Dave, like so much didn't make it into the books. And those are the stories that I did not find the most credible uh, ones that I felt my gut reaction was either they were fantasy prone or they misinterpreted something, whether it was a hypnagogic hallucination or a sleep paralysis. And again, I can't make a definitive statement on those, but again, they, they weren't for me. They weren't for me. I'll put it that way. So in the book, these are the most credible, normal, everyday people you can think of. I've got a priest. I've got law enforcement. I've got Homeland Security workers. I've got doctors. I've got the barista at your coffee shop, like telling these incredible, incredible stories and then going to work the next day. You know, that, that, that juxtaposition always astounds me. Like you have a paradigm shifting thing in your life, yet you still got to go to work. You still got to feed the kids and you're still watching TV every night. But your reality has been shifted in such a way that like a lot of the world has never experienced. And that was it for these people. And uh, it's just it's amazing. So, yeah, in the book, I cover many abduction accounts and uh, close encounter experiences as well with some of the most normal. And I, what does that word even mean? You know, normal, but the most down to earth people you can possibly think of. And that speaks volumes to me. And I hope to the readers as well. Can we talk about uh you know, before we wrap up here, maybe you could tell us about one or two of the most profound of the abduction scenarios that you cover in the book. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, the one that really sticks out to me right now is um, a gentleman named Michael. And he he was living in New York City at the time of this event up in Harlem. And um, he had just left a party that night, came home with his girlfriend, and they were really tired. They go to bed early. And uh he remembers in the middle of the night, he woke up out of what he thought was a dream, uh, but he looked over and his girlfriend was dead asleep. And he looks at the end of the bed and there's this shining blue light. And uh, he gets up a little more and he peers at the end of the bed and he sees a almond shaped head with big black eyes staring back at him. And... He didn't know what to do. And I remember it telling me, like, he's this huge, like, muscular black dude who's been through everything, hell and back in his life, living in, like, one of the roughest parts of New York City in Harlem. And he told me in that moment, all he could do was put the covers over his head and, like, crawl into the bed like a little kid. He was so petrified. Um, he's tapping his girlfriend, trying to wake her up. And this was weird. She wouldn't wake up. And he said she was a really, really light sleeper, but he could not shake her awake. And he was terrified. He's, he even checked under her nose to see if she was breathing. And she was, but he could not 
wake her up. So he didn't know what to do, man. I mean, he's just like crawled under the bed and, and whatnot, like saying, please go away, please go away. And while he's under the covers, he said he felt like he was being lifted the entire bed out of the room. And he could actually feel the wind outside and like smell the air outside. And he felt as if he was transported somewhere. And when he took the covers off, he was in a craft. And that that's really, there was nothing in between. He took the sheets off and he was in a craft by himself with this being. And uh, all he said was he was given a message in his head of um, a symbol. It was prayer hands with a lightning bolt through it. And he didn't know what that meant or how to interpret it or whatnot. And uh, that was it. He remembers waking up the next morning, going down to breakfast, telling his girlfriend about what happened. And he thought he was going crazy or he just had like the most vivid dream he's ever experienced. But then it kept happening. Like these events kept happening and he didn't know what to do. He was terrified. He was petrified. He was embarrassed. And he goes to the uh, the Strand bookstore, the Seas bookstore in New York City, and he finds a book on alien abductions. And again, he didn't know if that's what he experienced, but I mean, how, how the hell else can you really explain it? And he remembers bringing it up to the cashier, and he told me that uh, he felt like he was a teenager buying condoms, like at a grocery store. He was so embarrassed. <laughs> he just wanted to get the book and get the hell out of there. Uh, so he brings the book up, and um, the dude at the... Uh, the cash register is like alien abductions. This is weird. This is interesting. He's like, yeah, yeah. He's like, do you you into that stuff? He's like, ah, uh, no, not really. He's like, well, did, are you an alien abductee? And he doesn't know why he said yes, but he said yes. He's like, I think I, I think I was. And the cashier said to him, so am I. And boom, like that was it for him. Uh, he got this dude's number. Did we they just started... become best friends. Yeah, exactly, brother. He found his like abductee soul brother, and um, they started talking, sharing their stories with one another. And then slowly, Michael started meeting other experiencers in New York City and abroad, and um, tried to unravel this mystery. And uh, it's crazy. And again, going back to that symbol of prayer hands with the lightning bolt, he ultimately took this, interpreted this as a. Uh, faith healing which i thought was interesting this dude was not spiritual he was he didn't go to church nothing like that but as these memories and messages started to be unraveled and interpreted in his mind and i guess in his heart he eventually became a minister of a church and left new york city opened his own little ministry of a unitarian church and that was it man like this event or these events changed this man's entire path and this uh, is the story of MC Hammer. Today. <laughs> exactly. VH1 behind the music. Yep. Wow. That is Crazy. amazing. Yeah. So, so, again, it goes back to that human element of how these events change people. Isn't it interesting? The, the concept has always been that if we acknowledge the existence of otherworldly beings, that that, in fact, will cause people to go away from the church. When in this case, it actually drew somebody to the church. They felt as though they had received a calling from it. Yeah. I mean, I remember as a kid, I went to confession at my Roman Catholic church and midway through my confession, I stopped and I asked the priest, you know, beyond the partition, what, what are we allowed to believe in aliens? Like, <laughs> like, is it okay to, to think there's life out there? And <laughs> there was a pause and a laugh on the other side. And I just remember him being like, that shows how powerful God's creation actually is. And that really struck me, man, because I, I felt like, you know, this isn't something the church would condone or whatnot. And maybe it doesn't. But this priest in particular told me, yeah, do it, man. Like, believe in it. As long as you believe that God created those beings as well, I'm all for it. And I thought that was pretty cool. And, you know, as your faith changes and, uh, and and whatnot throughout the years. Uh, I have my own personal spiritual beliefs and whatnot, but um, it was empowering to know that, at least at that age, as a, a Christian, that it was okay to believe in these things. And hey, the Vatican has one of the most powerful telescopes in the world, and you can't tell me they're not looking for aliens out there. Come on. 
Well, the the Vatican came out, I think it was in 2006 or 2007, and they said it's okay to believe in life on other planets. Yeah, so man. What, what do they know? Yep, yep. Yeah. What do they know? That's a good point. There's so much secrets behind those walls that uh, hopefully we'll know someday. Hopefully. All right. Uh, we'll leave it with one more abduction story that really stood out to you and uh, go from there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. All right. I'll give you this one. Um, this woman, Shane, her name was, she uh, She lived in a um, suburb outside of Syracuse, New York. And she was an avid stargazer, always looking out in the sky. And she was seeing these really weird lights on and off as a kid, as a teenager for many years. And um, she remembered waking up one night and uh, something was going on. She, she looked down and she had dirt and mud all over her feet. She's like, what the hell? And she goes to her parents and she's like, uh, I think I was like sleepwalking or something. And they were like, what weird. So they started monitoring her and being like, maybe she's a sleepwalker. She's like going outside at night and whatnot. Um, so, you know, they kept a close eye and, and whatnot as the protective parents. And then it kept happening and happening. And then she eventually went to a, uh, a doctor to see, like, what's going on? And uh, the doctor told her, um, this, is, this is very unusual, like, very unusual. Like, you're, you're sleepwalking, but not only that, you're not, like, going to the fridge and getting some food or, or just, like, you know, going through the rooms. You're, you're, you're opening the door. You're unlocking it. You're going outside. You're coming back in. You're going into bed. Um, so they, they worked with her for a while with different therapists and psychiatrists to try to figure this out. And that's when she started uncovering these memories of what she believes to have been possible alien abductions. And these things went on for years and years and years. And every time she had these abductions, Dave, she, she felt like uh, there was a child involved somehow. This, this unspoken child that would say, you're my mom. And that shook her. That that she, what? What is this? And uh, that was that was interesting. And when when she finally um, kind of embraced that and looked at it as she got older, uh, she realized that she could not have children uh, back here on the ground in reality, as it were. And uh, that was very traumatic for her because she always wanted to be a mother, but somewhere. You know, out there in these abduction experiences, she appear apparently had this this child and uh, from another world somehow, some way. So that was very powerful and uh, interesting. And I thought brought a um, a level to all of this that, uh, yeah, yeah, that there's something going on, something going on. And we've had experiencers claim that they were pregnant before an event and then they weren't after or um that certain body fluids were extracted to create some sort of hybridization between humans and aliens. And look, man, that may sound really out there. And I know some of your listeners are probably rolling their eyes. But um, when you have people like Shane coming forward and saying, saying stuff like this and talking to these individuals face to face, which I think is really important, too, um, there's something to be said about that. And uh, I believe she believes this happened to her. So, yeah, that's just one of many. Awesome. Great stories, an amazing book. And how many, how many, how many new chapters or pages did you add to this edition? You said it was enough to be its own book. 80,000 words, which when I really uh, Googled, how much is a book really in words? They said, that's pretty much a, uh, a small novella. So yes, about, um, God, three new chapters. I got a whole chapter dedicated to the scientific exploration of UFOs as well. Many organizations looking at the topic scientific and coming up with incredible results, which is really exciting, uh, which just solidifies that something's going on. We can explore these things scientifically, philosophically, and everything in between. So, yeah, I hope people dig it, man. Um, I, I do think it's worth their time. And uh, look, I, I told people I would never buy a second edition of a book unless I was forced to in college. So uh, I hope it's worth people's time and money. And uh, I hope they'll get something from it because I truly did. 
Well, for those of you that missed out on it the first time, get this copy now. For those of you that bought it the first time and loved it and want more information, pick up the new book, Somewhere in the Skies, A Human Approach to the UFO Phenomenon. We have a link to the newest edition so that you can uh, read along and see more of these fascinating stories. Ryan Sprague, always great catching up with you. How can people keep up with you? I know that you do your own program and such. Where can they find you? Oh, absolutely, man. Um, I, uh, I currently have a show on the CW network. I hope people check out called mysteries decoded, where we look at all different mysteries, UFO specifically for me. Um, they can watch that for free at the CW seed.com. It's like CW's version of Netflix. Other than that, man, I'm all over social networks and, uh, Facebook and you can find everything I do at somewhere in the skies.com. We've got links up for all of that, so make sure you check it out on today's program. Thanks for tuning in. Be safe out there. We'll see you again next week with more of the best in true crime and paranormal talk radio. That's Tim. I'm Dave. This is Darkness Radio. Darkness Radio.